Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We give Summit Day 3. This session is Unlock Growth Opportunities, Collaborative Approaches to Scale Partnerships. I'm so excited to have you all here today. A reminder that you can enable closed captioning at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Click that little CC button. We have three incredible speakers today, all from collaborative funds all around the world, and I'm excited to introduce you to their work and all of their creative approaches to partnerships and partnerships at scale. A reminder to that at the end of this session, we'll have a really quick two question poll. So please stay on for the end. And also, uh, if you haven't been a part of a session before, you know that we are doing a raffle for a book from one of the speakers. So I, we hope you'll stay on. We'll pull a raffle name and we'll do that at the end. So we're excited to get into this conversation today. I am joined by Sue Snyder from the Equality Fund, Mark Philpart from the Black Freedom Fund, and Ati Worku from African Visionary Fund. We're so excited to have all of you here today. And a little bit of background around Philanthropy Together and our work with collaboratives. We are a global initiative to scale and strengthen um, the work of collective giving. And for us, that's everything from super grassroots giving circles to flow funds, to activist-led funds, to women's funds, to large-scale donor collaboratives. And so you three are such great examples of how that work is happening in practice. And our conversation today is going to be all around scale and scaled partnerships. And so I want to kick it off with Ati Warku, who's the co-CEO of African Visionary Fund. Would love to hear a little bit, Ati, about your origin story and the effort in this work. And I know that you have written beautifully about what scale and scaled partnerships means and how we redefine that. So would love to hear a little bit from you. Thank you, Isis. Happy to be here uh, having this really good conversation with you, Sue and Mark. Um, my name is Ati Worku. I'm the co-CEO of the African Visionary Fund. Um, at the fund, we are addressing systemic inequities prevalent in philanthropy and development, specifically in funding uh, local organizations in sub-Saharan Africa. And we consider ourselves a pooled or intermediary fund that uh, drives direct funding to African-founded, African-led, and African-based organizations. Uh, we've been around for about four years. Uh, we, since 2020, have provided grants to about 35 organizations across 13 countries um, in multiple sectors from health, education, livelihoods, human rights, mm -hmm. and technology. Um, so I think for us, uh, partnership at scale kind of comes in multiple forms. Uh, the most straightforward one we think through is the funding we do in multiple countries and multi-sectoral funding. So that has brought us into 13 different countries with partners that are working in multiple different sectors at different sizes of budget and reach and depth and whether they are ones that are scaling or the ones that are going for more depth. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what we think of like the most straightforward one, but the one that we didn't really think about that it would be, it would have a, an impact at scale from our work, which I think ICC and I talked about uh, recently is the work we do in advocacy. And this we originally thought would be kind of maybe a smaller part of our work, but it has taken a lot of importance uh, as we see the challenges deeper and deeper, the challenges African organizations face in the philanthropic and development space. And um, that has really led us to investing in systems change advocacy uh, because we believe it's part of our responsibility to constantly engage with uh, the network uh, of funders and share knowledge and resources on how we can all become more equitable and really move towards uh, really uh, making our funding more trust-based and long-term. Uh, and um, that adding of a layer of systems change work has really uh, brought us also to collaborating with you all here uh, with the We Fund, uh, I mean, We um, we Give Summit. Um, and um, one area that we're still thinking of like how we measure the success of because mindset change takes time, uh, but these are areas that we've seen um, some changes in, in the short term, particularly one that I would like to share around 
a one year work we did as a learning partner for the International Development Innovation Alliance, which has some of uh, the both private and government funders around the world in looking at how to create equity principles and metrics uh, as a framework to look at how do they do giving and what does it mean to look at giving in a more equitable way and what are the concrete things they could do in the way they move funds so that they can uh, reach more local organizations and could be more equitable. And for us, that's really important because we know that Statistically, from the funds that move into the continent, more than 95% of it goes to international organizations and local organizations get a very small percentage of that pool. And for that to change, it has to come from some of the bigger players. So we see our work at Impact at Scale, some of it as advocating to those funders in, and also supporting those we can in creating a journey where they can whether it's looking at the way they do their process or their criteria or some bigger picture questions they can ask this, themselves to think about how they move funding and who they move it to. Thank you for sharing all of that. In the green room, we were all talking about how all three of you as collaborative funds have only been around since 2020. So this work is so new, but so big and so bold. And that's what I love about it. I'd love as a follow up to hear from you. You uh, mentioned that you're, I think, in 16 countries across the African continent. That is no small feat in and of itself. So how did you sort of enable um, your team to be able to go into that many different geographies and build up that sort of partnership? Yeah, so we're in 13 countries and we really every year, so we do grant making once a year. And what we do every year is look at uh, the sources into whether it's an application or referral, what sources do we have out there? So that is per, the first ones are local organizations we know, those who have applied before, all the way to leaders around the continent. So we have referral partners that are individual, institutional across the continent. And then we look at the pool that comes in. And it, given that we want to keep a diversity, if we don't have, uh, we try to kind of compensate in doing a little bit more marketing uh, in very basic ways, WhatsApp and LinkedIn and multiple different contacts at multiple different countries and sectors and all of that to uh, put the news out that we are looking for new partners. And that has really been the very simple way that we've been able to kind of diversify that pool. Um, and then most recently, uh, knowing that we don't have a strong representation in Francophone Africa, we brought in actually a new team member that is based in Senegal and is a Francophone because we are all uh, Anglophone um, and it's very challenging to continue to deepen those relationships. So those are some of the strategies that we've been deploying to diversify the funding pool that we have. I love that our team at Philanthropy Together, we're all across the country here in the US. And I think that sort of virtual team and being able to have perspectives from the West Coast and the East Coast and the South and the middle of the country has really enabled us to develop deeper partnerships and deeper understanding of what's happening on the ground. And I hear the same for you that that um, how do you leverage team members as a way to build up partnerships? So thank you for reminding us about the relational aspect there. Yeah, and uh, existing partners as well. Current partners that we find are the biggest tool for us as well to kind of because they know in their community who is doing work in their cities, towns, countries, et cetera. I love that. I've heard that several times that, if, you know, donors who don't know where to give, if they just ask, who else should I fund based on my funding and in support of your work? So I really love that ripple effect. Thanks for sharing. I'm going to bring up Mark Philpart to the stage next. Um, and reminder to everybody, we'll have an open Q&A. So definitely populate the chat or populate the Q&A around your questions of partnerships and scaled work. Uh, Mark, welcome, welcome in. I've had the pleasure of working with you for many, many months now. Um, in many different ways. And it's just always thrilling to hear about your work. Can you kick us off with the origin story of the California Black Freedom Fund? And I know that you've done a ton of work at the partnership with the state level in California to secure investment. So I'd love to hear how that has happened uh, and what some of our listeners can take away from that experience. Yeah, thank you, Isis. And thank you to the Philanthropy Together team. Uh, this is a wonderful summit. And I'm honored to be here uh, with Addie and Sue to share a little bit about our work. Um, 
as you know, and some others in the audience may know, the California Black Freedom Fund was established in 2020, really amidst the racial reckoning. Uh, funders and organizers came together to transform the relationship that philanthropy had to the Black community. Uh, too often, when there's a crisis in the Black community, uh, there's a wave of support. And when the news cycles turn away, uh, that support recedes. And it's it's impossible to really advance justice, to advance self-determination, to advance any sort of liberatory framework on episodic flash funding. And so the Freedom Fund was really was born with the goal of sustaining investment uh, in Black power building organizations, organizations that are specifically uh, doing more to engage Black people in policy making processes so that they can have a self determined future and really uh, win decision making opportunities. Um, to advance racial justice throughout the state. And so that's the ethos that the Black Freedom Fund was born from. And really within uh, just three years, uh, we've had tremendous success. Um, you know, we, we have a, a fundraising goal of raising $100 million and investing in uh, the Black power building ecosystem in California. And we're about 70% to our goal. We've raised $67 million. Uh, we've invested in uh, 135 organizations throughout the state. Uh, $40 million has gone to those organizations so that they can continue to do the important work that's necessary to bring about justice in California and beyond. And so uh, we're really proud of that work. And uh, while we have more to do, uh, we're, we're incredibly and tremendously grateful to everyone who's participated in the journey thus far. Um, it really has been a collective effort. The Freedom Fund uh, is, is kind of situated within Silicon Valley Community Foundation right now. Uh, and it really has um, the, the spirit of partnership at its core. Um, that is really what has fueled it to this point. We have a CEO circle of, of funder partners who actively fundraise and help to um, build the momentum necessary uh, to get the investments needed to move money to people on the ground. Um, we have a advisory committee that is comprised of community members who are really deeply engaged in helping to shape our strategy and direction and making sure that we stay on the right track. Um, we have a whole host of other external philanthropic partners who, who also stay engaged and work to build our capacity in a way that allows us to have the impact that we're seeking. So all of these different things really amount to uh, a series of, of activities that really um, go beyond the grant making alone. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to point out, as uh, you mentioned earlier, Isis, you know, I come from uh, the advocacy world. And so uh, for me, you know, the, the, the thing that has always resonated is that the state has skin in the game and they should be involved in this work in ways that not only are focused on policy change, but um, allowing uh, the public sector to invest as a partner to philanthropy in some of the really critical work that's happening in community. Um, and so I wanted to uh, leverage that uh, leadership and my experience in advocacy arena to be able to get lawmakers to the table. Um, and we were successful in starting an initial partnership with the state legislature and the governor getting the state of California to make an initial investment uh, in the work that we're doing and really helping us to get to our goal. Um, that is in part because we had to organize, you know, we had to engage the Black caucus in a deep way, um, get members of the caucus to understand what we were doing and see the value in it. Um, we had to engage members of the budget committee um, in the legislature. We had to engage the governor's office. Um, and all those conversations amounted to an initial investment, which is really putting us on the path 
uh, to do some more successful work in our community. And in order to unlock some of those resources, we also had to partner with the California Community Foundation to, to really program those dollars. Um, and the California Community Foundation, you know, has a track record of doing this work. Um, at not many institutions are willing to take public money. And so, you know, really trying to find an entity that could be a partner with us that understood what we were doing and really trying to um, help us along so that those resources could get to people who need them was was critical to this effort. So those uh, are the ways that the, the kind of partnership has manifested to really drive more resources to the ground to organizations that don't have the infrastructure to, to get these dollars, that don't have the infrastructure to withstand a government audit should one come, um, that don't have the infrastructure to do the reporting uh, for public sector dollars. And, and I think that's a critical way that intermediary funds, collaborative funds um, can play a role in unlocking new opportunities for organizations and really expanding the pie in a way that um, doesn't really draw from the same trough, but is uh, bringing, bringing more resources to the table in ways that allow people to, to continue to expand and deepen their work. So I'm really excited about that. And I know there's more to come. Uh, another element of that partnership is work we're doing with the legislature around the state of Black California, where we're doing town halls throughout the state to hear from community leaders and really ensure that uh, Black issues and perspectives are part of the policymaking process in a deeper way. Um, that's one thing that the caucus itself couldn't do on its own, and they needed a partner to be able to uh, elevate their platform and help bring community leaders into relationship with them in a deeper way. And so we're doing that work all across the state with a series of six town halls. Um, if you are in California and you're listening to this, we might be in a city near you. Uh, we encourage you to please join us. You'll see more information on our website as we begin the process of really um, rolling out this State of Black California series. But I'm really excited about the work ahead. And I thank you all for the opportunity to share just a bit about what we're doing. That's so inspiring, Mark. And um, for those who don't know, Mark's team is quite small. And so to have this scale of vision with such a small team and everything that you're doing, it's really, really inspirational. So I all encourage you to check out all of the speakers' work uh, and follow along. And one thread I want to pick up is that you mentioned that not um, not everyone takes government funding. And so I think that's a good reframe that partnerships isn't about what somebody else or like what you need, right? And that you're always asking, 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 but it's just as much about what somebody else needs and how you can be the right fit. And together, that's what really makes a strategic partnership. So thank you for elevating that as a thread. Uh, I know that your work also is very timely right now with everything here in the US happening in the news around uh, concerns of funding racial equity given recent Supreme Court decisions. And so I would love to hear a little bit more about some of those more timely partnerships that you're undergoing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we're all facing headwinds of some sort right now. Um, but for those of us who are pursuing racial justice, there is a anti-DEI wave um, that is really um, uh, trying to influence philanthropy um, in ways that are quite harmful. Uh, we've partnered with a coalition of funders and uh, legal partners um, that include uh, funders like Latino Community Foundation, Tipping Point Community, uh, Rosenberg Foundation, James Irvine Foundation, the California Endowment, uh, and, and so many others, San Francisco Foundation. Um, you know, these entities came together in part because they realized there was a big gap in California where our community organizations were not getting any information about some of the ways that um, these challenges to uh, race conscious programming were taking shape. Um, they, they weren't getting any information in the courts uh, or from the courts or from the, what was happening in court processes, uh, nor did they have legal counsel who could inform them. And so um, we wanted to be able to provide some education and put them in a position where if they needed defense, they could get resources. 
in California, we actually, and, and many of you who are listening to this, you know about the Fearless Fund, you know that they um, are being sued by a conservative uh, a litigant who is basically saying that you can't give money to, um, uh, uh, you know, Black women entrepreneurs who are leading uh, 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 organizations that they founded. And essentially, um, we've had two of those challenges take shape here in California. Uh, many people don't know, but um, the city and county of San Francisco is being sued for a, a, a batch of their guaranteed income programming um, and their guaranteed income programs. There are four programs specifically. Two of them uh, are focused on uh, serving transgender communities uh, in, in San Francisco. Uh, the other is um, focused on serving uh, expecting mothers. Those two programs are co-managed by our grantees, uh, the Abundant Birth Project and the Transgender District, respectively. Those organizations, because they aren't named in the lawsuit, don't get any information about the court proceedings, but they're deeply impacted because they co-manage the program with the city and county. In the case of the transgender district, they have about 55 uh, recipients or households who get $1,200 a month. They don't know if that program is gonna be shuttered because the city and county is just gonna settle or whether the program is gonna have an opportunity to continue to um, complete its course. And so we're working with organizations like that to make sure that they have information from trusted legal sources who can tell them what they what, what is happening, what the needs are, what they should be careful about, what the risks are uh, associated with their programming, and then uh, providing them with tools that they can use um, as they are moving forward. So they'll know, uh, one, if they have questions, they'll have a FAQ doc, they'll have a risk assessment tool, they'll have a legal memo that they can review for any questions they might have, et cetera. And so we're pulling all that together um, with lawyers like the Lawyers Committee, um, Adler and Colvin, which is a nonprofit uh, law firm, and also engaging uh, public counsel here in, in California and MALDEF. And so, um, you know, it's a big tent, um, but what we're trying to do at this initial phase is make sure people have the information that they need and that they have the opportunity to uh, defend themselves or get resources for pro bono defense when they need it. Um, so that, that initiative is called LEAD, Legal Education, uh, Advocacy and Defense for Racial Justice. So. Uh, you'll be seeing more about that soon on our website as uh, everything gets updated. But Lead for Racial Justice is something we're really excited about and is desperately needed um, given the headwinds that we face in this moment. Thank you for sharing that. And that's also a great um, sort of reminder for us all that partnerships and partnerships at scale also mean just information flows and that so often information is siloed or cut off as a way of control and power building or you know ruining power for folks so uh really appreciate that reminder as well thank you for sharing mark uh next up and last but not least i'd love to bring sue snyder to the stage she's the vice president of strategy innovation and impact at the equality fund welcome welcome sue so happy to have you here I'm so inspired by the story of the Equality Fund because you all actually, I know you're gonna share this, but you started out as a women's fund. And we have many folks here who are uh, coming from women's funds, coming from giving circles that then turn into women's funds. And so it's just incredible to see the trajectory that can happen through growing and scaling work. And so I'd love to hear from you a little bit more about the origin story of Equality Fund. And I know also that you really move all sorts of capital from funding from government to individual donors to institutional philanthropy to investment funding. So we'd love to hear a little bit about how you manage all of that kind of uh, partnership at scale. Sure. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thanks to all of the participants who are engaging in the conversation and to my colleagues, Ati and Mark, who are um, getting some of my you know, creative juices flowing as well. So the Equality Fund, we've just started our fifth full year of operations. And 
Um, when I started with the Equality Fund five years ago, five and a half years ago, we were about 13 people. Um, we would have moved less than a million dollars in grants um, around the world to uh, women and girls and gender diverse um, folks. And um, this year, uh, we'll be moving about $27 million um, around the world in our grant making portfolio. So we've gone from about $500,000 to you know, $3 million to $8 million to 13 to 20, and now we're up to $27 um, million a year. So um, a super exciting and slightly crazy uh, growth trajectory. Um, alongside of that, we've also attracted a seed investment by the Government of Canada, a $300 million seed investment in um, a gender lens investment portfolio. So we're really trying to rethink what a women's fund um, can be in terms of a business model. And our role is to really unlock funding. Um, you know, any sort of feminist analysis brings with it an analysis of power. And the origin story, I would say, of women's funds around the world, of which there are over 40 now, I think we're the only ones in Canada, but there's many women's funds around the world. And um, women's funds, women's funds were an innovation about 20 years ago, because women started realizing that there was money moving around the world for women, but none of it was getting into the hands of women. It's kind of like having a husband that gives you an allowance. You know, you, you can benefit and sometimes you get access to the money, but you don't necessarily own the money. The money can be taken away. Um, so there were some concerns around the feminist activist communities around the world about women really being positioned as beneficiaries. Um, and that just felt like um, really not living into the potential of change that women and girls and gender diverse people could bring to gender equality and all of its kind of beautiful intersectionality. So that's kind of the origin story of women's funds. 20 years ago, I think women's funds were an incredible innovation. And, you know, I lift up my colleagues at the African Women's Development Fund, like they're kind of considered, and other women's funds, kind of our big sisters. And so the Equality Fund is kind of trying to push the edges of what a women's fund can be and can do. And um, we are really focused at scale. Like we're really, really focused at solving for scale. Lots of people are interested in putting money into the hands of women, into supporting their wisdom and their power and their um, line of sight to local solutions. But it's not always easy to get money around the world into the hands of women. It often gets diverted into other hands. So our specialization is really as an activist fund. We feel like we're part of the activist movement around the world around gender equality. And our role is really to, um, to explore how to mobilize and unlock as much money as possible and then flow that in abundant, unrestricted ways to women's organizations around the world. And Isis, you had asked me about, you know, as a collaborative fund, um, how does it work with all of these different types of money? So we are a solution for governments to move money at scale into the hands of women. We work with philanthropic institutions around the world who want to achieve that same objective. We work with individual philanthropists, um, from monthly donors who give, you know, $30 a month to, you know, individual philanthropists that have really, really leaned into this space and giving circles. Um, I think what I've learned, Isis, is that you can't take a, a lowest common denominator approach to how to make money work. You have to look at different sources of money, government money, philanthropic money, investment capital, and I think you really have to design pathways into your collaborative solution that maximizes the beauty of each of those different types of money. And then exactly like Mark said, similar to you know, what he's doing, we have to de-risk that money and then allow it to flow abundantly in ways that our partners can best absorb to lift up the work that they wanna do. So we don't do thematic funding. I mean, we fund gender at the intersection of everything, gender at digital, gender at climate, gender at 
you know, in, indigenous, um, you know, just gender and, and violence. So um, what we say to our partners is we try to take your money and maximize the characteristics of that money. The way that you can work with philanthropic dollars and the way that you can move with government dollars is not the same. And often what government wants is for all money to be treated like government money. <laughs> and that is what we consider kind of a lowest common denominator solution because then all of the rules around government money, all of the risk approaches to government money, all of the political orientation to government money, all of the reporting around government money, all of which Mark and Ati are nodding their heads and smiling about, all of that is, is totally okay. I, I mean, we, we all understand that government money is public money and, and there are no problems with how that money needs to move. But what we've tried to do is we've tried to ensure that, that we maximize the beauty of government money, but we don't force all of the money that comes through the Equality Fund into the government bucket. So I think that is what scale, that's some of what scale means to us, ISIS, is trying to design pathways and systems and relationships so that the different types of money and the different characteristics of money can move in ways that really maximize the impact that that type of money has, instead of kind of taking money and creating a bit of a lowest common denominator consensus point, um, which kind of takes away from some of what you can do. So I'll stop there. I can go on about this forever, but. No, I love that. I, I think the idea of uh, really looking at all the sources of funding in their unique buckets, but then you all being that thread and bridge and connector across all of them is just so powerful. And I hope others on this call are inspired to think about all the sources of money that could be part of their work and how to thread that needle. Um, we've also talked before you and I, Sue, about the sort of how can you not have one plus one plus one equal three, but one plus one plus one really equal 10 and how uh, partnerships at scale can just totally flip the script around what is possible, what innovation can look like. Can you share more about your perspective on that? Sure. So, I mean, we've spent the last five years, I think, building individual program areas. So our individual grant making program, our philanthropy program, our investment program, our, our policy and advocacy program. And our trajectory over the next three to five years is really to start to live into the possibilities of the model and the intersections in the model. So what, what we really want to start thinking about is what might it look like for philanthropists to go on a journey at the intersection of philanthropy and impact? So many individuals think about, you know, what kind of impact can I have with my philanthropic giving but there is, a, there is a huge amount of impact that can also happen with investment decisions and um, you know, investment strategies. So what does it look like when you activate impact across the entire continuum of capital that you have access to? Um, in our grant making, we are, I have to say my grant making team, and I don't take credit for this, but my grant making team is just incredibly good at participatory grant making. You know, we are the majority of the organizations in my in the Equality Fund are based in Canada, not all of us, but many of us. And we try to make as few decisions about our grant making portfolio as possible. Legally, we have the kind of final approval of it in Canada, but almost the majority of our money decisions about the grant making, um, you know, portfolio, they're made in a participatory way by colleagues in the global majority or for, for some of you that like the global south sometimes is, is how we refer to that. So my question is what can our what can our investment team learn about participatory decision making from our grant making team? Um, the Equality Fund again was built to intentionally spark creative collisions. And I have the advantage as the vice president strategy innovation and impact of kind of sitting at those intersections. It's really exciting to put feminist activists from our grant making team in a room with um, investors and see what happens because they don't speak the same language. They don't come from the same sectors. Um, one team comes from a sector where the capitalist markets are considered you know, a great fuel and a great system for um, making money. And others consider the capitalist system as being incredibly harmful. Um, how do you navigate those conversations? So ISIS, we're 
I think the next trajectory for the Equality Fund and working with our partners around scale is trying to think about where are the intersections and edges that innovation can really happen and how can we bring kind of the full possibility of this model together, um, both for our partners who move money with us and through us and also for our partners who are the catalysts and change makers around the world um, working at the intersections of gender. Such a good reminder that partnerships come, each of us in any sort of partnership come with a worldview and that worldview can be very different and how part of the work of partnership is even just getting on the same page, especially in such a world where jargon fills all of our days so much. So thank you for sharing that reminder. I'd love to invite Mark and Ati back onto the stage now, this virtual stage, and we can have a little bit of a group discussion all together. Um, so while we take a moment to see if there's any questions in the chat, I'd love to kick off with one that is, you know, you all are small teams. You haven't been around for really that long at all in the grand scheme of things. You're moving huge dollars. I mean, Sue, 300 million. Mark, you said 63? 73? We've like, invested 40, but we've raised about 67. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about dozens and dozens of millions of dollars. This is not small scale work. And I think sometimes that can also feel daunting of how did you even get there? How did you start that conversation with the Canadian government to get a $300 million infusion? And I'd love for you all to place us back. What were some of the actual steps you took, like the most tangible small scale steps you took to begin uh, leveraging some of these scaled partnerships? Mark, you want to start and then Ati and then Sue? I'm I'm happy to um you know in a very practical way we had to think about it from a campaign perspective um we had an idea a vision of like you know the government investing in this work and you know we started with drafting a letter and saying you know this is what we think you know should happen uh in terms of the state making an investment and then we talked to lawmakers about that letter. Um, and, oh, I should say, because uh, there may be other foundations on the line, we had to engage our legal partners to make sure that, you know, we were operating within the bounds of the law. Um, and, and really, our work fell under a collaboratively funded project exception um, that allowed public and private foundations to support um, a request for an investment. And so we were able to champion it. And then we engaged other partners um, from philanthropy, as well as our community partners, um, to really make the sign on letter um, more of a um, movement activity, uh, and not something that we just submitted on our own to a person in an office uh, somewhere in our capital. So we galvanized our community, got uh, signatures and got support from all the various partners that are engaged in touching the Freedom Fund. And then we talked to lawmakers. We we spent time in the Capitol having conversations, talking about the pros and cons of this approach, why it's necessary, um, and really trying to get on the same page with the caucus as a starting point and then other important uh, stakeholders in the in the capital and in the governor's office. So that's literally um, how it took shape. Um, and along the way, we were inspired. Um, we were inspired by uh, our partners in Canada who, uh, you know, like the Equality Fund and the work Sue described has um done tremendous uh, work. Um, the fund uh, for the Foundation for Black Communities in, in Canada is another example. Um, Rebecca Darwin and Liban uh, Akabor are doing in, incredible work there. And all of that inspired us to keep going and to keep uh, pushing so that we could get to this point where uh, we got the state to consider doing this. And I think it, it really is a series of dialogues that we have to be prepared for. And then, you know, making sure that we have advocacy infrastructure um, so that, you know, the community, the chorus of folks who uh, support the things you're trying to advance are able to speak on your behalf. 
Love that. It's all conversation at the end of the day. They might be big and bold and scaled conversations, but it's all just conversations. Ati, what about you? What were some of the first steps you took to build out AVF in your work? Yes. Uh, one second. I thought I was still on mute. Um, so I was making sure that I was not. Um, so for us, I joined just a few months after the fund was started, but my co-CEO, Katie, and the founding working group we had, which was a number of um, local leaders from Sub-Saharan Africa that um, have started in running nonprofits across the continent, really helped us create what the ethos of the African Visionary Fund would be. And from how we'll give grants, what kind of grants should we give, all the way to what kind of leadership structure should we have, which led to the co-leadership uh, model that uh, we decided to adopt. And then uh, from there on, really, it was just we were able to raise a little bit of money the first year. So by the time I joined, we'd already made six grants because that's all the money we had. But we were really intentional about moving the money as fast as we could as we learned with our partners. So uh, the decision originally was made, we make three-year grant commitments. So we made our first grant and then we really continued building the company as we were making grants every year. And the number of grants we made increased every year. <clears throat> I think last year was the largest, which was uh, 13 multi-year grants. Um, so we went from six to eight to nine to 13. Uh, and now we're on the process of raising a, a bigger fund. But then from finding the fund side, we really went from the angle of first looking at all the funders that fund on the continent and our Oftentimes we hear them talking about how they can't find the, the organizations they want to fund on the ground and things of that sort. So going to those funders and on one hand advocating for looking within to see is there anything within their own criteria or processes that is cutting out organizations of a particular uh, region or particular size or sector. And then on the other hand, is there what else could they do to make sure that they're attracted they're able to move the money. And one of those options is moving it through an intermediary so that we can absorb larger amounts of funding to kind of get through that uh, issue of, we cannot give smaller grants and we'd like to move money in a much larger scale. So that's kind of the other angle that has really helped us kind of get in that space. And then starting with, like I said earlier, with as a DAF within kind of set within a fiscal sponsor until we, decided what would be a better legal structure for us and then slowly kind of moving out of that. But it really was, uh, the key for us has been involving our partners in all of our grant making and portfolio services program design and really using ourselves as just kind of like the aggregator of all the information and making sure that things really make sense. But really for every solution we have, all of it has come from uh, multiple conversations, surveys, discussions that we have with our partners, and then from our grant making committee to um, our new strategy, our current partners are involved at multiple levels of decision making within uh, within our organization. And one thing we're looking forward to doing as well is from a legal framework, we've been working with our council to figure out better ways in which we can actually have fiduciary responsibility added from our partners uh, within the U.S. legal system. System, It gets a little bit complicated with conflict of interest and having to list everybody you fund and then if they're on your board. So just some things that we're trying to work through, but it really has just been, I think for us, staying very close to the organizations we fund and others in the space as a feedback loop. Uh, continuously to help us grow and learn and change has been, I think, the through line through everything we've been doing. I love that. Sue, I think I'm going to switch to one of the questions in the Q&A um, for your uh, follow-up, which is, uh, what would you all have done differently? Any failures or lessons learned? I think it's easy to share about the 10-year overnight success, but we know that it really took a, you know, a long time and lots of work. So what, were, what was a failure or a lesson that you've learned? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna talk about our grant-making strategy. I mean, there's so many failures, quite frankly. 
um, so many. I mean, it's just a constant. I mean, starting up is just a constant iteration of learning and realizing you're not doing it right. I think the hardest part around being a startup and growing and into scaling is that what worked in year one when you were 13 people and you figured it out doesn't work in year two when you're 25 people and doesn't then all of a sudden in year three you're like okay now we have to figure this out all over again because now we're 40 people and we're 20 million dollars and so you're kind of constantly realizing wait a sec we're now failing at something that we thought we figured out last year because it doesn't work now as you start to continue to grow and scale I think one thing in particular ISIS is that we thought that we were doing pretty good quite frankly in our first call, our first grant making call, when we when we kind of said, you know, how do we solve for grant making um, grant making protocols that really minimize the amount of effort organizations need to put in to attract funding? You know, so much effort goes into attracting funding, and so many executives directors spend all of their time trying to get funding, funding, funding. So we really tried to minimize and simplify that process inside of our first kind of call for grants. So we did a very simple organizational profile process. You know, we kept it very high level. We looked at kind of eligibility and then we really kind of zeroed in the organizations that we felt were really aligned. Then we asked them to do, you know, more detailed applications. And then we used a participatory process using a global advisory panel to make final decisions about allocations. But the need was so high. I, I mean, in the end, about 3% of applicants received funding. And we realized that felt like a failure. <laughs> like in one sense, our process was better than any other processes that maybe were kicking around at the time. But we realized that we were asking the wrong question. Like we were kind of asking the question, you know, how can we make competitive funding processes better? The, the better question is, are competitive funding processes the right way to move money? And when you ask different questions, you get different answers. And so we started asking ourselves different questions. We said, well, what might a non-competitive process look like? One of the values of our organization, which comes out of the Black feminist community, is radical love. What, what, does, a, what does a grant making stream look like based on radical love? where you know, where everybody is trying to think about how can this raise up the ecosystem instead of create competition inside of an ecosystem that's all trying to work together. So I think that's that's been one real kind of light bulb moment for us that it's okay. not that we necessarily failed in one of our early grant making strategies. It's just that if you if you ask the same questions that everybody's been asking year over year, decade after decade, and you're not getting the results that you want, then it's maybe time to think about asking different questions. Thank you three so much. This has just been a very quick 50 minutes. I feel like we've learned so much. You talked about partnerships from the level of advocacy around not just thinking about what you need, but how you can really support others in their partnership. We talked about looking at the different pathways of giving and not coming at that lowest common denominator thing. Mark, you talked about how partnerships can be timely and really rooted in relationships. So thank you all for sharing these nuggets of wisdom. Uh, our whole theme for this year's Week of Summit is activate together. And that to us means that we want everyone to take action from here. And so I invite everyone who's still with us right now to please Think about how you might consider bigger, bolder visions for scale and scaled partnerships in your work to uh, follow along with some of what uh, Sue and Mark and Ati are doing.